Okay. So today I am going to talk about a topic that is really near and dear to my heart. Um, how to protect our ecosystem from supply chain attacks. This is something that has kept me awake at night since 2017. And so um, I'll talk about that as I go through my presentation. Uh, the, the supply chain, we all know now because of what happened in December with solar winds. Now everyone is focused on supply chain. But what we, I've been focused on it since 2017. And so what I thought I would do was kind of talk through the evolution of our third party risk slash supply chain risk management program at Rockwell Automation because we have been focused on it and we have continually added more and more to the scope of our program over the years. And it just astounds me how much there is to this, to this program. And so what I'd like to do is just kind of go through it so that you can use it to kind of do a gap analysis of your own program. Have you missed any of these aspects of the ecosystem and what we all need to work together to protect? So before I get started, I would like to just, uh, Kim read my background, so I probably don't really have to go through this anymore, but I did start out as a software engineer programming nuclear power plants for Westinghouse, so that part was not in my bio. Um, went to Carnegie Mellon, continued as a software engineer. So I was a software engineer until 2001, and in 2001 is when I became interested in security. So at that point, I got a job at CERT, um, the CERT program at Carnegie Mellon University, which was the very first cybersecurity organization in the world. What a place to start my security career. It was awesome. And then in 2013, Rockwell came along and recruited me to come and create an insider risk program for Rockwell. And so I did that until 2016 when our CISO left and I became the CISO. So I'd also like to tell you a little bit about Rockwell so that you understand where I'm coming from and why security is so important to us. So Rockwell Automation creates industrial automation and control systems and software. And so I'm going to talk about that a little more in a minute. We are, just so you know, the scope of the company. So we did $6.3 in sales last year, 23,000 employees, and we're in over 100 countries. And the reason that we take uh, security so seriously at Rockwell is because of where our products are used. So if you just look at this, these are the critical infrastructure sectors that use Rockwell products. So chemical, if you think about a chemical plant, if our products could be compromised, then the attackers could use that to do whatever they wanted in the chemical plant. And you can imagine what would happen if you change the recipe and the process of how chemicals are manufactured. Same for life sciences. They are creating drugs, pharma. If they could get in there and hack our products, which contain the recipes and the formulas and, and control the process for creating drugs, you can imagine what could happen. Roller coasters. When you're on a roller coaster and you're flying around and you're curling towards the ground, that's our products that know when to put on the brakes and when to speed up. Same with wastewater, oil and gas, power. So that's why I took the job at Rockwell because I, at that point, I was an insider threat expert. And I took that job because I thought, what if an insider at Rockwell would plant a backdoor in our product so that someone could get into our customer environment. So that's why I took the job because 
it was a really very important challenge that I felt like somebody needed to address. So what I'm going to talk about now is, so how did, how did I become so interested in third-party risk and supply chain management? So it all started, you know, before I even went to Rockwell, um, we had a third-party risk program. And that third-party risk program in the good old days, it was pretty simple. Basically, we looked at engineering service providers so anytime we signed a contract with a company that was going to supply us with people that were going to do work for us, like software engineers, or that were going to develop in their own environment for us, we did a third-party risk assessment of them. And we also looked at technologies that we were bringing into our environment, like IT tools. And we did a third-party risk assessment when the contract was being signed. And if they passed, they got the contract. And then we would look at it again whenever it was time for contract renewal. And when I say, you know, it sounds very basic and very rudimentary, but actually at that point in time, a lot of companies didn't even have third-party risk programs. So although it sounds very simple, um, that's where a lot of companies actually still stand today. Then the world changed. So in 2017, this is when I went, to, I, 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 my awareness and my fear <laughs> of supply chain threats, this is when it all changed for me personally. And that was when NotPetya was unleashed and impacted the world. And the reason that that hit me at Rockwell was because of how not Petia was propagated. And that was when Russia compromised a tax software company called ME Doc. And so here's this company that creates ta tax software that all of the companies in the Ukraine have to use to file their federal income taxes. And so what they didn't know was that Russia had compromised their software distribution mechanism so that when they pushed out their product update, they also pushed out NotPetya to all of their customers. And when that happened, I thought to myself, I, I always had been focused on protecting our customers. And I always, you know, I came to Rockwell as the insider risk director when 2017, I was CISO, and when Not Petia happened, I thought, wow, so Russia did that deliberately to get to ME Docs customers. What if they compromised Rockwell to do the same thing to our customers? And that's when I thought, oh my gosh, uh, this totally changed my perspective of third-party risk. And then the same thing happened in September. Um, CC Cleaner, a free utility that you can use to keep your PC running efficiently, that was hacked and malware was included in their product. Same thing. When people downloaded their next version, they got malware and they were infected. So what this did for me was it, it made me think about our security program and I realized that we, we couldn't just think about ourselves. We had to think about the entire ecosystem. And so as Kim read, the vision of our security program is to ensure that Rockwell Automation and our connected enterprise ecosystem are safe, secure, and resilient. So what does that mean? This is what we developed in 2017 as our security program, and we still are using this today. So on the left-hand side, you can see is Rockwell Automation. So we have to protect ourselves, and that includes our IT, our manufacturing, our supply chain, and any third parties that are part of that the IT or OT infrastructure. On the right-hand side, we have our customers, so we have to protect our customers. And that includes the security of our products 
as well as any third parties that are part of those products, any mergers, acquisitions, partnerships that are part of those products. And then there's the in-between, there's that overlap. And that's our connected services. So Rockwell connects to our customer environments. So those connected services, our solutions, and third parties that are part of that ecosystem, including like, for instance, cloud providers. So this is how we defined our cybersecurity program in 2017. And that is what we have been marching to ever since. So the thing is, in 2017, what I realized was we need to protect the supply chain from us. So here I was until this time worried about protecting Rockwell from our third parties. But in 2017, I realized, but we're a third party to our customers. And so we need to protect them and make sure that we are not putting them in danger. So we looked at the security of the entire ecosystem, which I just showed you, the security of our development environment. Now, we had been looking, we, we've had a secure development environment at Rockwell that we kicked off in 2013. But what we realized in 2017 was we can't just look at where the developers are developing their code. We had ec extra controls around that. But now we had to extend that and look at our software distribution mechanism and make sure that that was included. We had been developing a secure development life cycle for years. And in 2017, we, we had to, we got certified by IEC 62443, which is the certification for industrial control systems. So our secure development life cycle was certified and we pushed it out to all of our developers. So we had to institutionalize it, make sure that we trained every developer in the company. And now every year we're audited to make sure that we still are adhering to that SDLC. Product security testing. We realized in 2017 that our pen testers, that they're the last step before we release a new product, the pen testers were finding security vulnerabilities that the developers could have been finding. So why not incorporate product security testing right into that SDLC so that every developer is testing their own code for security all along the way? So by the time that the product gets to the pen testers, they can spend their time looking for the complicated stuff. Open source management. That's a really important supply chain issue. Any company that develops software will tell you that we all use a lot of open source. And so we realized at that point that we needed to be managing that open source environment. We needed to have a software bill of materials because those open source products, they also have security vulnerabilities. So when you have an open source module that has a vulnerability, you need to be able to look into your product portfolio and say, which of our products use that open source module and that version that has the vulnerability? We also revamped our code signing capability. Um, we developed a coordinated coordinated vulnerability disclosure program for our product security. And of course, we already had our insider risk management and third-party risk management programs. So I mention that because I've been talking about this for years, that we need to protect our customers as part of their supply chain. And I don't hear other people talking about that. I think now everyone's talking about it because of solar winds. But I thought I'd give you this list because hopefully it's a checklist that you can use to check your own product security and infrastructure security. So, okay, that was 2017. Then in 2018, an iPhone chip maker blamed a WannaCry variant for shutting down their plants. 
And so when I saw that, I thought, okay, we already have a manufacturing security program at Rockwell, but what about, we have other companies that create products for us. So we have factored product suppliers. We have brand label product suppliers. If you don't know what that means, then you might not have it at your company. But it's worth asking your manufacturing organization, if you have manufacturing, ask them if you have companies that produce products in your name, brand label them for you. And if so, then you really need to include them in your security program because they basically are you. They're an extension of you. Then in 2019, the software supply chain became evident because there were 11 security flaws that were disclosed in a real-time operating system that is used in routers, printers, industrial control systems, and many IoT devices. So when we saw this, we realized oh boy, you know, we've been worried about our third parties. We've been worried about ourselves. We've been worried about our brand label and and factored product suppliers. But what about those products, the software that we buy and we include in our own product? And so at that point, we had to, again, evolve our program to protect our customers from our own supply chain. So at that point, we started looking at our software suppliers and we looked at the security of their ecosystem. And do they have a secure development environment? Do they have a secure development life cycle? Do they do product security testing all along the development cycle? Do they manage their open source? Do they have a software bill of materials? Etc. So we took our list and we started applying that to our own software suppliers. Okay, so that was 2019, one thing that happened. But then we also saw that we were get, seeing account compromises that were coming from vendors, customers, distributors, systems integrators, partners. So Employees across Rockwell would forward an email that they received from someone they knew in one of those companies in our ecosystem saying, I sent you an email yesterday. It wasn't really me. My account was compromised. Don't click on the attachment. And that's when we started realizing again, oh boy, so that ecosystem is even bigger than we thought because now we have these other partners and customers. And if they have an account compromise, they put us at risk. And this was a big issue back in 2019. And so we thought, well, what can we do about that? I mean, account compromises can happen anywhere. Um, Last year, that was a big big deal. They seem to have kind kind of decreased now, but I'm knocking on wood while I say that. But at that point, we realized, yeah, but there are small and medium businesses that we do business with that might not have a robust security awareness program. And so we need to start communicating with the ecosystem. We need to do outreach and make sure that the the companies that we do business with understand security, have a security program, have a security awareness program. And so we still do this to this day. Um, Actually, yesterday I did a presentation for our Rockwell Supplier Conference. We have a supplier conference every year. And so a standard part of that conference is that I give them a security awareness update. And I gave them actually a kind of a portion of this presentation yesterday because they need to understand what's going on with solar winds and all of the supply chain compromises that we have been seeing recently. And then, of course, along came ransomware. Um, it, It was 
around before 2019, but 2019 is when it started becoming more prevalent in businesses. And in particular, in the manufacturing sector, because in 2020, manufacturing was the top sector hit by ransomware. So why is that? Because companies are getting a little better at recovering in IT. We hopefully all have thought about backups and recovery processes. But in manufacturing, it first of all, manufacturing cannot tolerate downtime. If you ask a CIO how, or, or anyone, how much business will we lose if we lose SAP for a week? They probably can't tell you. They don't have that at their fingertips. But if you ask anyone in manufacturing, how much business will we lose if this plant goes down for a week? They can tell you, they can look it up and they have that readily available because in manufacturing, that's what they're looking at, productivity, and they can't tolerate downtime. In addition, it's very difficult to recover manufacturing. You don't just load the backup tape and recover systems. You have industrial control systems that are tied to to IT systems that are connected to your enterprise. And so it's very complicated. And the attackers have realized that. And they've realized that companies that run manufacturing environments are much more likely to pay the ransom. And so they are hitting manufacturing. Um, Oops, I did not want to go to that yet. So what did that mean for our program? Well, the interesting thing is that in 2019, we started getting notified by our own manufacturing supply chain that they were hit with ransomware. So a company would notify us, we were hit with ransomware. We can't supply that component to you that you that, that you were counting on, that you need to produce your own product. Some of them said, we'll be down for at least a month. And so... You know, interesting from a third party risk perspective, we never worried about suppliers to our manufacturing, you know, people that supplied us like copper, you know, physical components that we use in our products. We didn't care if they had a cybersecurity program because, you know, they, they, it doesn't impact our cybersecurity. They don't have access to our information. They don't have access to our network just so they get us those boxes of things. Well, in 2019 and 2020, we started realizing that actually we do care about their cybersecurity because if they are taken down by ransomware, then they can't supply what we need to create our own products. And so we started looking at integrating our critical manufacturing supply chain into our third-party risk program. So we met with the senior vice president who's in charge of uh, all of our plants and talked through it with him. And they identified their top critical suppliers. And we started working with them and assessing their third-party, their cybersecurity program. And we definitely did find deficiencies that we then worked through with them. And then the scene, I know I'm successful when the senior vice president comes up with his own ideas. And he said, you know, Don, I I do worry about our suppliers, but I'm also thinking about our distribution centers, because if we can manufacture our products, but we use third party distribution companies, if they get taken out and they can't distribute our products, then we just have warehouses filling up with products that we can't get to our customers. So again, we expanded the scope of our third-party risk program and started looking at those third-party distribution centers that we use. So that was a really interesting new angle. Um, And, you know, it's I I find it fascinating. Hopefully you're not bored, but I find it fascinating to just look at how that scope of third-party risk and supply chain risk just keeps growing and growing. And I did really feel like we were doing the right thing when 
In 2019, one of our customers, we saw it in the newspaper, the newspaper, in the media, that this customer had to bring down their operations and everyone was speculating it was ransomware. Well, I happened to know someone there. And, and so I reached out, he's in charge of their OT manufacturing security. And I said, hey, I heard that you were hit with ransomware. And he said, no, actually we weren't, but we have this critical supplier and they weren't, but they have a critical supplier that was hit with ransomware. So that company brought down their operations, the ransomware brought it down. They couldn't supply to our supplier. And so they had to shut down their operations and they can't supply us. So we had to shut down our operations. And this is a very huge company that we're talking about here. So that's when I realized, ooh, I think we're on to something here. So if your company runs manufacturing, please take note of this. Okay, so then 2020, 2021, the big one, right? Um, I don't have to tell this audience about the solar winds hack. Um, the solar winds hack pointed out some really important things to us at Rockwell. One, I hope that everyone is thinking about is the way that Russia was able to compromise the Orion product. And that was through the build environment, the build process. And so, as I told you, we've you know, we've looked at our security of our company. And of course, we all know that no matter how hard we try, if you're up against Russia, there's a good chance they're going to figure out how to get in your network. But we also had extra controls around our development environment. But the way that they compromised the build process at Solar Winds is totally new and very concerning. So um, I've heard the CEO of Solar Winds talk about what they're doing. And he basically said, we're building two totally separate build environments. No one has access to both. So in order to compromise both environments, you would have to compromise multiple privileged user accounts. And they are going to do that all their builds in parallel and they have to come out and be exactly the same. So if one of them is compromised, not the other, they'll know. And he said, this is very expensive and very complicated to build this kind of environment. So there has to be a better answer. Um, we actually started a working group under the Cybersecurity Collaborative. And one of the, the um, senior managers on my team is leading this working group to bring companies together to try and figure out what are best practices that we can put into place to protect our build processes and build environments from this kind of attack? So that was one lesson learned from solar winds. I'm going to talk about another one soon. But next, let's talk about Code Cove or Code Cove. I've heard it pronounced both ways. But that supply chain compromise really scares me because. First of all, we haven't heard a lot about it. So I'm just wondering what is happening with that? What happened? Is it still ongoing? Was it Russia? Like what's happening with that? But basically CodeCov, in case you aren't aware, it's a company where you can upload um, your development artifacts and they test your code. So they find vulnerabilities in your code. This is used by some really large companies, including a company that develops tools for software development. And that's the thing that really scares me about this because, uh, I mean, this is a big company that develops tools that software developers use all over the world. So if they uploaded their code and it was compromised or it was gotten by these attackers, could they then use that to figure out how to compromise those software development tools that so many companies are using? So that's a scary one. It just, it just goes to show the sophistication of these attacks 
and the thought that's going in, like they're not going in trying to compromise CodeCov to get to their customers necessarily. They could be compromising CodeCov to get to their customers' customers. And that's what really scares me. And then we had Kaseya, of course. So solar winds messed up everyone's Christmas vacations last year. And then Kaseya messed up 4th of July. So thank you, attackers. Can't we at least get a break? 2021 has been such a, I mean, let's face it, there's never been a year like this in security, I don't think, between all the ransomware attacks and the supply chain attacks. You know, we're not getting a whole lot of sleep these days. And so I really wish we could at least get a break for the holidays. So Kaseya develops a product which is used by managed service providers to manage their customers and this zero day vulnerability in their product was used to unleash ransomware against the MSSP's customers. So again, we have the product that is compromised is not used to compromise Kaseya's customers, but to compromise their customers. And so our supply chain attacks are not just going one hop now. They're going multiple hops, and that is extremely frightening. So the one thing that this has really pointed out for us at Rockwell is we need a third-party incident response team and a third-party incident response process because these are really getting complicated. It used to be, you know, a, a company would send us uh, a letter or an email saying, hey, we were compromised and some of your, you know, like uh, an insurance provider would notify us that some of your employees' personal information was compromised in our, our hack. Um, and so then we had to deal with that. You know, we had to deal with that one company and the information that was compromised and the employees impacted. But now, like with solar winds, we sat back and said, Ooh, so what do we do with this? What are the implications for our third parties? Who do we really need to worry about being compromised as part of the solar winds attack? And so we could have gone out to all of our third parties. I know one CISO, I heard him say that they just pressed a button in their technology, their tool that they use, and it just sent an inquiry out to all of their, their third party vendors and asked them, you know, put, gave them a questionnaire. Were you impacted by the solar winds attack? To me, that just doesn't feel right. First of all, what do you do with all of the responses? So we decided to focus on who are the most critical companies that have access to our network. So if they were compromised, that could give the attackers access to our network. And so we looked at it from that angle and tried to determine who do we really need to look at. And then with the Kaseya attack, we also are implementing a new technology platform for third-party risk. And so we said, okay, can we go in there and search to see if any of our third parties use Kaseya? And what about fourth parties? Because some of our third parties outsource to fourth parties. So we realized that we need to gather all of that information. This is why we have this new technology platform so that we have a lot more ability to be able to figure out when something like solar winds or Kaseya happens, are we impacted? So I think that third party incident response process is a really important new best practice that we as a community need to work together to define. And then we had the Excelion breach. And so the Excelion breach brings another new angle to third-party risk. So with Excelion, and you probably all are aware, but Excelion has a product used for secure file transfer among companies. So let's say company A uses Excelion to exchange information with 
of their customers. So then a zero day in Excelion is used to breach Excelion products around the world. And by definition, the information that those attackers got from those products was confidential. If it wasn't confidential, they would just email it to each other. They wouldn't use that product. So they get all of this confidential information. And then they send the extortion, the ransomware, the ransom demand to company A that owns the Excelion product. But the information that they got out of that product was for all of those other companies, as well as maybe company A. So all these other companies had information in that Excelion product, but they didn't get the extortion demand. It only went to the company that owned the product. And so that just made me really sit back and think, hmm, it's kind of interesting. Like in our contracts, we, of course, have breach notification clauses that if you are breached, you have to tell us within a certain amount of time. But it almost feels like we need to add a little more language that says, if you receive an extortion demand because our information was compromised, you need to bring us into that conversation. Like we should be part of that decision making process. So, again, just another angle to third party risk and supply chain management. And so, we've been at Rockwell figuring out every time something new has come up over the years, we figure out what do we need to change? What do we need to add? How do we expand the scope of our third party and supply chain risk management program? In May, the White House issued the executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity. And so now it's mandatory. If you do business with the US government, then you have to adhere to this executive order, which is still being defined. So we don't even really know what that means yet. But we do know that it will, number one, it will have requirements for your development environment. And secondly, it will have requirements for your supply chain, for your software supply chain in particular. So at Rockwell, we looked at that and said, boy, I'm glad that we've been addressing this issue for all these years because, you know, it, it's, it's a new thing. It's one thing to go to a third party, give them the questionnaire that looks at their network security and do they patch and do they have security awareness programs that's one thing. It's a very different animal to have to work with your software suppliers and determine, do you have an SDLC? Is it institutionalized? Do you have a software bill of materials? Do you have an open source management program? Do you do product security testing? This is a totally new kind of um, information that you need to gather. And you know, they can check the boxes, but then what do you do if they don't check the right boxes? Do you just say, well, sorry, we're not going to do business with you anymore? Do you try and work with them? And this is where I feel like we really are all in this together. And there are a lot of smaller or medium-sized companies out there that will not meet the requirements of the executive order. And so we have to work with them. We can't just say, oh, well, we're not going to do business with them anymore. We have to work together to push out and to help all raise the bar for all of us in the, in the supply chain. And then just one last thought um, before I get to my summary slide, which is mergers and acquisitions. So this is part of our third-party risk program. Anytime we're going to do a merger, an acquisition, or a joint venture, our third-party risk team is the team that does the due diligence and looks at the security of this company that we're going to acquire. And so we have that process. But I have been told anecdotally that there have been instances where a company, a big company announces we're going to acquire, you know, Joe Smith's company. 
And it, the deal didn't close. And Joe Smith's company, of course, is not yet integrated into the big company. And so I have been told that there have been instances where Joe Smith, the little company, has been compromised by an attacker that knows their goal is to get into this big company. So if they know they want to get into this big company and they have a good security program, they kind of watch the news. And whenever this company announces we are going to acquire this smaller company, they compromise that one and just sit there and wait until it's integrated into the big one. I've heard that anecdotally, but I haven't actually seen any cases where that's happened. If anyone knows of any, I would love to actually see the evidence that this is happening. But that's a, that's a scary part of third-party risk management that I think we all have to think about and incorporate into our M&A processes, which is another area where I think the community needs to work together to come up with best pr practices for the M&A process. So in summary, uh, I think third-party and supply chain risk management is one of the biggest threats that we're facing these days. I don't think anybody would disagree. I think we have ransomware and we have supply chain attacks. Right now, those to me are the two top things that we need to be thinking about. And so I'm hoping that this presentation may have either provided you with um, kind of a benchmark that you can say, yep, we're good. We cover all of that stuff. Or it may have helped you to identify some gaps that you didn't think about. And so, again, just I, I want to close with we're all in this together. We need to work together and just protect the whole global ecosystem. And so with that, I will open it up for questions. Oh, and I don't know if I told you to enter questions into the chat. So if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat. And I don't think we, I, I don't know if we have any. Kim, would I see it in? No, I'm coming. I had some technical difficulties. I'm coming. Oops, sorry about that. As Murphy's Law would have it, right when it went to me, I had technical difficulties. So sorry about that. Um, Problem. We do have many questions. So thank you, Dawn. Um, one of the questions I had have is, what does Rockwell suggest for third-party access? What type of controls are promoted? Well, so that's a tough one. I guess for one thing, um, the controls that we require depend on the risk that each third party poses to us. And that's the really neat thing about this new platform we bought, which I'm not going to say the name of it. I don't want to plug a certain vendor, but it enables us to actually categorize the types of third parties and then designate like what level of risk they pose. And that in turn then determines what level of assessment we need to do for that vendor. So if this is a vendor that... Um, has really critical confidential information of ours, we'll go as far as to do an on-site assessment of their security controls. Um, but, you know, it just depends on the level of risk that they pose to us, what controls we require. But there is a minimum set. Um, the minimum set is, uh, I wish... I wish I had my other presentation from yesterday handy that I gave to our suppliers, but it was like security awareness, patching, um, network incident response, policies and governance. And there are two more, and I cannot think of what they are. But um, you know, there are some foundational controls that we require and then more if you pose more risk to us. Well, you guys are Rockwell Automation. I'm sure that there's 
it's not easy. You, know, you probably have more controls than your average company. But the next question is very similar. It says, does Rockwell use an external third party vetting vendor? And if so, what benefits were realized over internal? So are you using outside parties to vet your vet vendors? Um, we don't use third parties to do the vetting, but we do use one of those security ratings companies to give us, you know, I'm not going to say which one, but like BitSight security scorecard, you know, that type of company. Um, we do use one of them to just give, it's a data point. We don't use that as like, oh, okay, they have an A, so they're fine. But we do use it as a data point. And specifically, if they have a uh, a poor score in that rating system, then we know that we need to dig in to it is at least into one area, if not more, whatever is uncovered by that rating company. But um, no, we do our own vetting. We have our own internal team. Coulter said, seems like most vulnerable companies or software supply chains are the largest ones with the largest IT environments, which are more likely to have gaps. Maybe it's a good time for smaller software companies. Yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that because my fear is that they're going to use the smaller companies to get into the bigger companies. So I, I guess I think we are all at risk. And so we, we really just all need to work at strengthening our security programs and making sure that whoever we're doing business with also meets our security standards. Um, Edward said, I don't think you have to answer all this. How big is Rockworth, Rockwell's security team? And then he's asking how much your annual budget is. Not sure you can answer that, but yeah, I would be curious to know how big your security team is. Well, so our security team is distributed all over the company. So we have the CISO office, which is governance, security awareness, third-party risk management. Um, we support the insider risk investigations and program. Um, so that, that's the CISO office. Then we have our IT security team, which is responsible for the operational security controls and compliance. And then we have a product security office with a chief product security officer. And so they are responsible for product security. And then we have um, a services team that provides security services to our customers. And they also are responsible for the security of those connected services that we provide. And then we have a, um, a model where we have security, um, they're called product security leaders in every product development team. And they work in conjunction with our product security office. And then for our um, software supply chain and our product supply chain security, we work with our quality team in our manufacturing and our sourcing organizations. So it's really hard to say because basically we have security all over the company. And I think that's, that's I love that. I love doing it that way. And I love that connected enterprise ecosystem security framework that we have because that's why we have it. That, that's how we execute our security and make sure that we are not missing any pieces of the ecosystem. Well, that's pretty awesome because we have a lot of CISOs from very large companies that do not have that big of a security teams in place. I don't know if you agree with me, but it sounds like you guys have a pretty amazing platform of your security team there. I'm very proud of our security team and our security program. Um, yeah, every company does it differently. Some of them are very centralized. And so they could tell you, like, I'm the CISO and this is how many people report to me and I am in charge of all security. Then there are other CISOs that have a distributed model where you have BSOs, business information security officers, 
distributed throughout the company and they're each responsible for security of their business, but they had to have to adhere to the standards that are set by that central CISO office. And then there's our model where um, we have a chief product security officer, myself, we have a VP of IT security, and we have a VP in charge of all of our services. And really, we all work together. We are the security leadership for the company. So ultimately, if something happens, I am the person that is responsible, but I don't do it by myself. We, you know, all four of us are at the VP level and we all work on security together all the time. Well, I personally have a million more questions to ask you, but I better get back to, and I'd love to have you on my and security for all radio show sometime. Cause I, I think you're amazing, but um, let me go back to the audience. Cause they still have tons of questions for you. Henry said, totally agree with you on TPRM and M and A. However, if the targeted last secured company got breached, a TPRM is only unable to pick that up as a TPRM. Don't look at the actual events. Yeah, we had uh, an acquisition that we did and we were concerned about, um, first of all, they were critical acquisition and they were bringing a product to us that was going to become a critical product for Rockwell Automation. And so we decided we can't take any chances with this one. This one was much different than other ones we had done in the past. And so the first thing that we did was we had a compromise assessment done for that company. And we did that right as soon as we closed the deal. And that's what I did when I became CISO in 2016. I thought somehow I need to know what I'm inheriting here. And so we had a compromise assessment done and I felt really good after we did that, that I knew where we stood and I knew that we didn't have any major breaches. There was no APT in our network, at least not that they detected. Um, So we did the same thing with this acquisition. So that's the kind of thing that I'm thinking about is, do you do a compromise assessment before you integrate the company into yours? You know, things like that, I think, is what we need to think about as a best practice. I have someone else that said great presentation. I've had many people that say great presentation. Understanding the fourth parties looks like a difficult job. How do you validate getting full data, B-O-M-S? Well, that's part of the executive order is those S bombs. And yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about that exactly. Um, It's been suggested that maybe every company has to publish their software bill of material. And personally, I don't like that because if I publish my software bill of material and then an open source provider discloses they have a vulnerability, the attackers out there can just scan the internet and look for, hey, what products use that open source module? And then I know exactly how to how to get in there, how to compromise them. So it's going to be interesting to see how this executive order actually pans out. So Thomas said, who makes the decisions on to go ahead if business wants one thing, but the risk evaluation disagrees? Yeah, we, one thing in Rockwell, I am really lucky that we have support from the CEO on down for our security program. And so I, I can rely on the fact that our leaders get it and they typically trust us because my office has proven that We'll work with you. You know, if if you're in the business and you really want to do work with this vendor and they don't meet our standards, you have two choices. The business can say, okay, forget it. We'll go with someone else. But there are times when they say, look, this company has something no one else has and we really need to work with them. 
And so then we will work with that third party to help them and tell them, here's what you need to do to meet our criteria. This is what you need to do. And then they've done it. I mean, we've, we've gone through this in the past. Um, if the business disagrees with us and says, no way, sorry, we have to do business with them now, we can't wait, then we'll escalate. And so we look at what risk does this third party pose? Do they pose a risk to our network, to all of Rockwell? If so, then we have an executive security council that we would escalate to. And that's a council of senior vice presidents that report directly to the CEO. So it, we've never gotten to that level. But if we did, that's the process. It would go to the ESC. If that third party only poses a risk to that one business, and it, it's not a risk to the network, it's just to that one business, then we escalate up their chain all the way to the senior vice president if necessary. And we have not had to do that because, like I said, our, our office really has developed a reputation for, you know, we work with you and we know what we're doing. And if we say that this is a big enough risk that we should put a roadblock in the way, then it must be a serious risk. So when I'm looking over here, I'm looking at the screen and um, I'm not being disrespectful. I'm reading all the comments of how many people are saying, thank you for this presentation. Thank you for being here, Dawn. Um, it just goes on and on saying thank you. Um, if we were at a live event, normally after our keynote speakers, there's especially keynote speakers like yourself, there's usually a long line of people standing in line to talk to you. And all these people would be because it's numerous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I do want to thank you so much. And hopefully you take a moment to go over on the Engage platform because you can actually read the comments. But I failed to mention that Dawn was also so in this book, Women Who Know Security, Women Know Security, 100 Fascinating Females Fighting Cybercrime. You can still find that book on Amazon. If you were at our events, we still carry these books around and give them out. And that is how I found Dawn. So thank you for everything that you're doing. I think you're an amazing woman in cyber. So I know your, bit, your schedule, obviously, with everything we just heard from you is I'm very busy. So thanks for taking this time to be with us today, Dawn. Well, thanks. Thanks, Kim. I, I'm so excited about this opportunity. And man, I wish that we were live in Pittsburgh so I could see all of my fellow security professionals in Pittsburgh. But um, well, yeah. we'll be back in Pittsburgh in 2022. So I okay. will do my best to secure you to be live <laughs> as our keynote. I mean, I again, you know, it's not I don't have a lot of opportunities, you know, still in our industry, you know, there's 20% of women like you, but the 20% are so amazing. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks. And if anyone wants to reach out on LinkedIn, please do. Okay. And you can also, if you go to our network lounge, you'll see um, Dawn's profile will be there. And if you message her, I don't believe it doesn't give your email, but it, if it, if they message you, it will go to your email. So, or you can go to LinkedIn. Dawn's been very good with answering her LinkedIn. So thanks for all your hard work that you're doing out there. And um, I look forward to seeing you in the future. So thanks, Thank Dawn. Thank you. Thanks.